Praise God. Praise God. A lot going on here at the Springs Church, huh? It's good. It's good when there's activity in the house of God. It's a good thing. I know we've been praying a lot, but uh, we're going to pray one more time. This is an important prayer over the word, right? Let's pray. Why don't we do this? Why don't we stand together, if you don't mind? Can we stand together as we pray together? I know some of us get a little tired and we get through worship, but let's refocus our energies and let's ask God to meet us this morning. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, as I was just sitting there in worship, I was just reminded from your scriptures that there's only one, only one who is good. And Lord, we we come to you recognizing, God, that, that no man has the ability to communicate your truths. And no man has the ability to hear your truths. There's only one that could give us that type of power and that type of grace, and it is you. And we are asking this morning that you would open up this word and you would speak Father, we we have a desire in our hearts to honor you. You put it in us. It's not our own. You gave us a longing to serve you. But we cannot serve and we cannot honor you without your word. We cannot serve and get up and be given for your kingdom and for your causes without something of your anointing and of your spirit. And God, we're coming to you and we're saying we're not perfect people. We fail. We make mistakes. We do things wrong at times, but we turn our hearts to you and say, God, that desire still remains. We want to honor. We want to serve. We want to be given, but we need your word. Would you have mercy meet us with your word today, we pray. And we ask this in the only name that is good, the one name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Praise God. You may be seated. You may be seated. We're going to get right into it this morning. I, I have uh, had a word on my heart this week that has not been easy to get down on paper or uh, to go over or, or even to stand here and share, but I've entitled it, Finding Christ Again, Finding Christ Again, and I think you'll understand what that means as, as we get into it. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. We're going to go to Luke chapter 2. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 20. We're going to read a large portion of Scripture, and then we're going to begin dissecting it together. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 20. It says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Jump down to verse 3. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ Jesus the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angel went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for, they, for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Stop there. It's a very famous passage of Scripture. It's, it's, it's the Christmas story. Um, we all know it. We make nativity scenes about it. 
we teach in Sunday school from the very start. We, we quote it and recite it every Christmas Eve when we come to that Christmas day in churches and with believers. In fact, many movies have been made about this specific passage, Luke chapter 2, about the coming of Jesus, the birth, the virgin birth. Even non-believers know the story, right? If you were to go on the streets today and you were to say, hey, could you give me a little bit about the birth of Jesus? They could tell you the plot pretty well, even those who aren't Christians, who've never accepted him. They could tell you about the virgin birth. They could tell you angels in the sky, shepherds, that they know the context of everything that was said and everything that was written right here in Luke chapter 2. We become so familiar with it that we no longer see the magnitude and the scope of what really took place. I want to take a moment, and I kind of want to take a, a view from eternity. I want to back up, and I want to look at what this really was, Jesus coming to the earth from the beginning of creation all the way to his birth. What, what actually unfolded? What was taking place all through the history of mankind? Give it some context. Give it some magnitude before we dive into the scriptures and we dissect it this morning. This revelation of Jesus, this promise, was something that was growing. It was growing every generation in greater and greater magnitude, in greater and greater strength. The revelation, you could go back from the very beginning, even when Adam fell. And what did God say to Adam? There'll be a Savior that comes that will be born of the seed of the woman. There's a prophecy from the very start. From the very beginning. And you go on and you find out in Abraham's time, you know it's a seed of a woman, but then you find out later it will be from the nation of Israel that this Savior will come. You go a little bit further to Jacob, you find out, oh, he'll come from the tribe of Judah. The revelation just begins to grow. You go beyond Jacob and you take it a little bit further and you find out from David, oh, well now we know the sex and the family. He will be a male and he will come through the lineage of David's genealogy. Isaiah then finds out it'll be a virgin birth. Micah tells us that it's going to be in the town of Bethlehem. You see the revelation. You see the promise. It just keeps growing. It's like a wave that is coming up in magnitude and power, and it's about to crest. And then you have Luke chapter 2, where it starts crashing down, and everything that has been prophesied, everything that everybody's been waiting for, comes about. Can you imagine, and again, we, we've romanticized the story so much, and we become so familiar because we have Jesus and we have his presence, but could you imagine living before the time of his birth? Think about it. Think about God's holiness and power being revealed to humankind and knowing that in your heart you can never please him. You can never bring anything of any acceptance or any worth. That all of your best works are nothing but filthy rags in the eyes of God. Imagine the weight of sin. You're failing constantly, and there's no mediator. You never feel forgiven. You never feel cleansed. The scriptures even said in the book of Hebrews, the animal sacrifices couldn't clean the conscience. You would go back home, and you'd feel like an absolute failure every single day. And you, and you get back up, and you say, I'll try even harder only to fail again. And there's nothing. There's, not, there's no hope for you. Imagine giving up all your relationship with God and say, well, I'll just, I'll just take care of my crops, and I'll take care of my family, and I'll, I'll buy some land, and I'll, I'll make sure I have a large family so my genealogy continues and, and my family name, and you pour your life into everything else only to follow out and find out, like Solomon, it's all vanity. You get to the end of it, you're unfulfilled. You have no contentment. You can't go to God because he doesn't fully accept you. You're trying your hardest, but every single day you're feeling the weight of your guilt and, and the area of your shame and your sin, and you go through this every single day until you die. That's what life was like before Christ. In fact, some of us forget what it was like before we knew him. See, I want you to take this. Think about this. Think about mankind 
hearing these promises, hearing this revelation, feeling the weight where they just can't connect to God, feeling like that they're absolute losers and failures and there's no mediation, there's nothing between them and the Lord, and, and, and looking at all the types and the shadows, but you keep hearing these promises. You, you keep seeing little pieces of the puzzle coming about. A virgin birth, Bethlehem, he's going to be a savior. You, you hear these things, and could you imagine the anticipation every single generation? Could this be the generation? Could Jesus come in my time? Could I see what I'm hearing, what, what it might be? Can I know the full context of it? Every generation, when Jesus showed up, the tension in the air was astronomical. It wasn't light. It wasn't just a nativity scene. All of mankind was groaning. All the revelation in its magnitude and strength was coming about. The wave was about to crest, and here he comes. Now take all of that in Luke chapter 2, and what I want you to do is I want you just to keep thinking about it and just hold on to it for a second because we're going to shift gears. I'm going to rabbit trail for a moment, and we're going to go into the book of Ephesians. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to bring out a few things, and what we're going to do is we're going to bring this rabbit trail back around to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to combine the two, to two thoughts together and bring, bring what God wants to speak to us today out of the Scripture. So just hold all that we just talked about, the magnitude, the cresting of the ways, the revelation, the anticipation of mankind. Put that on a shelf for a second and turn to Ephesians chapter 1, and I want to read something to you, and then I want to begin bringing a few truths out, and then we're going to put them together. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through 19. Paul writes this. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation, now watch this, in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might. Now watch this. Hold on, Luke chapter 2. We're going to take a moment. We're going to rabbit trail. Now watch. Paul comes into the book of Ephesians, and he says this. He says, Christianity is a supernatural life. It's a life. God invades our humanity through Christ's sacrifice. God comes to live in us, and then he comes back, and he says, but, but that life is connected to something. That life can only grow. That life can only come with strength and power and magnitude as you grow in the revelation of Christ. He says the more you see who he is, the more you look into these scriptures and you see his vastness, you see his mercy, you see his goodness, you see what he really did when he died on that cross. Those types of revelations that strike the human heart cause joy. Cause peace, cause worship, cause sacrifice, cause is a giving to God. Life begins to come out as you grow in the revelation of who he is. That's why I love one of my favorite quotes from Ravi Zacharias. He said it like this. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. If that's what you think Jesus has done... You're wrong. Jesus came to make dead people alive. Yeah, he came to put life in us. We're supposed to go up and get up every day. And no matter what circumstances are going around in a Christian's life, we are to have joy, Scripture says. We are always to have hope. Not us just wishful thinking, thinking, oh, I'll just think the best. Forget that. A life inside of us that cannot be conquered. A hope that can never die. Paul says, you're supposed to be walking in that, and the only way you're going to walk in it is if you grow in your revelation of who he is. Now, here's my problem. I don't know about you, and this is not an accusation, but this is just dealing with truth. I don't find much life in the church today. I don't. Our young people are bored. They're tired of church. 
and we can't even keep him in the doors. We'll put on concerts, we'll do everything, that won't do it. We can't keep him in this house. You say, well, how do you know people are dead? I'll give you a perfect example. I go from church to church to church, and all I'm seeing is people spending more money on bigger screens, bigger sound systems, bigger light shows, bigger worship teams, and they're doing everything they can to get you to open up your mouth and sing, and me to open up my mouth and sing. And can I just say this? For most of the church, we all just sit there like this. No life. If you had life in you, you don't need a sound system. You don't need a light. You don't need a screen. You will start shouting to God. Every, you'll wake up with a song in your heart. You couldn't stop it because of the life of God. How do I know people don't have life in them? Well, let me put it this way. You can't get a prayer meeting to get off the ground in churches anymore. Where's your faith? Where's my faith? If we really believe God was going to move in our city, we'd get into that prayer meeting and start to pray. We get on our knees and start crying out to God. If we truly believed that God wanted to meet our families, if we truly got up with a hope in our heart, the first thing that would go off the handle in a church is a prayer meeting. And I'm not making an accusation here. I'm just looking at the scope of the reality of where the church is in our country, nation, and worldwide. You don't see prayer meetings anymore. They don't exist. You know why? Because there's no life. See, there's something that just bothered me as I was reading Luke chapter 2. Something that just, I, I couldn't, you ever just read the scriptures and something just annoy you? It just annoys you. You can't sleep, it annoys you. You get up, it annoys you. You walk around, it annoys you. I couldn't get it out of my mind. And, and this is what just annoyed me. Coming back to Luke chapter 2 now. Now watch this. This is the single most important event, not just in human history, but for eternity. Angels are on the edge of their seats for this event. Demons are sitting on the edge of their seat for this event. God himself is sitting up in heaven, twitching a little bit, waiting for the event. I mean, this is, this, this is like the event of all of eternity. Mankind has been waiting up to this point. The revelation, the puzzle pieces are coming together. And, and yeah, clap your hands. This is amazing. But this is what bothers me. This event happens, and the first people that get invited to come see it face to face are a bunch of shepherds sitting in a field. You clap. You must understand it because I don't get it. There wasn't a high priest. There wasn't a scribe. Caesar Augustus was in his palace. He wasn't there. The only people that get the invitation to see this glory, to see the heavens open, to see the choirs of angels, to have joy and life in the presence of God begin filling their own bones as they're sitting looking at this baby and absolute humility and helplessness, but knowing that that is God. The first people that get the invitation are some shepherds. And then because it's boggling my mind, I start reading on it. Because I just can't understand it. I can't figure it. This is, this is the single most important event in all of eternity. It's like Bill and Ted get to go. A bunch of dummies. They, they're, they're the ones. It, it doesn't, I'm, I'm just sticking in my mind. They're the type of guys with the potato gun out in the field. Just laughing it up. Acting like fools. They're not, they're not exactly the ones that are, have everything in line. And as I think about it and I get into it, I start reading. And then I find this out. Do you know, to be a shepherd in that time, it was a despised occupation. People hated it. They hated shepherds. You didn't want to be a shepherd. You'd be a fisherman. You'd become a Pharisee. You'd become a scribe. You'd become a carpenter. You, you get a, hey, even be a tax collector for the Roman government. But you don't want to be a shepherd. Shepherds were despised because the occupation, listen to me, was uncomfortable. You had to live out in a field. We talked about this last time I preached with the camping. No one wants to live in a field. That's just ridiculous. You lived out in a field, and you woke up with dew on you every single morning. You know how comfortable it is to get up, and you, your, your whole garment is wet, and you're tired, and you're cold, and you're dealing with the element. It was an uncomfortable place to be, and it was a place that nobody wanted to go. Nobody wanted to entertain that place of occupation. And yet the glory of God in the deepest revelation that all of mankind has been waiting for for centuries shows up to these men in an uncomfortable place. 
Let me say it the way God spoke it to me. God has been challenging me. It's been a challenge in my devotional time this last week. Pastor Gary said, how was your vacation? I said, terrible. He said, why? I said, God showed up. He challenged, 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 challenged. And he spoke this to my heart. He said, Michael, if you want to grow in my life, you want to grow in deeper areas of faith, deeper areas of power. You want to grow in places of greater hope and authority to be able to sing a song even in the darkest hour. If you want that type of life, then you must be willing to go to very uncomfortable places. You must be willing to get that type of open heaven, to get that type of revelation. You must be willing to be in a place that most of the time your flesh will not want to be. He said, what do you mean, Pastor Michael? Well, let me try to explain it to you out of the passage itself. Look back at chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. I'm going to pull out a few points here, and then I have two points, and we close. But just watch, and I want you to see it from the Scripture itself. It says, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Jump down to verse 3. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee and the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swallowing clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. I want to paint one more picture for you. Watch this. You've been waiting in anticipation your whole generation, hoping you would be the one that Christ comes and meets. You'd receive the revelation in the life you've been waiting for. Your whole lineage has been waiting for. You're waiting on it, and you're sitting in it in. And I want you to see this, and Jesus actually shows up. He's sitting in the womb of Mary. Two couple come to that door, Joseph, who's betrothed to this young wife, and they knock on it, and they've been traveling for days on end from Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem. They're tired. They're a poor family, Scripture says. Later on, we find their poverty. They have no money. They're carpenters. They, they have no place to go. I don't know if they had any relatives because Scripture says they show up at an inn. So they come in, and they knock on the door. And here you have this poor family who's pregnant and in need. And they're broken, and they're hurting, and they're tired. And could you imagine the innkeeper? He turns around from the door, and he says to everybody in the inn, we got a couple here who's in need. We have a poor couple. They're in poverty, and they need something. They need help. They need somebody to take them in. And could you imagine as every person in the inn starts going and looking at their bed and saying, you know what? We're on a long journey too. We're tired ourselves. We can't give up our comfort to help the needs of others. We can't, we can't get down from where we're sleeping. I got my family here. I got things I got to deal with. And can you imagine as one voice after another says, ah, just let him go. We got no time. We got nothing we could do. One voice after another, and the innkeeper turns around and looks at Mary and Joseph and says, I am sorry. But we're not willing to get uncomfortable for you and shuts the door, and there the revelation of Jesus just moves on. Could you imagine that? That that night they would have saw the angels. That that night, they would have heard the choir singing. That that night, they would have walked away like the shepherds with joy and hope and peace, singing for the things that they've seen and the things that they heard, but they miss out on all of it. They miss out on all of it because they're not willing to give to need. They're not willing to go beyond their own comfort to help those who are hurting. They're not willing to open the door and put themselves in harder situations in their own life to make sure somebody else is blessed. They let the need go on. And they lose the revelation of Christ and lose the life that comes with it. See, God is, I mean, he's been so challenging my heart. And there's two places he's been challenging me. Two places, needs that he's been bringing into my life that he's saying you have to be willing to open up your heart and to receive these needs and to give if you want to grow. And I'm going to give those two places. And can I be honest? I'm going to challenge you as a church today. This is not going to be fun. Get ready because the medicine doesn't taste so good. The flesh doesn't feel good when it comes. But I'm going to be honest. It's right and it's true. 
The first place God has challenged me in my own heart and my life, and you hear this, is in my finances. I'll say anything else. Talk about grace, Pastor Michael. No, 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 no. Talk about, talk about worship. Talk about, don't, don't, don't go there. But I'm going to be honest. That's where Jesus went. So I'm going to share what he shared. Look with me back in Luke chapter 16, verse 10. And I want you to see this out of Jesus' own mouth. Luke 16, verse 10. He says this, 10 to 13. You, I got this underlined. I didn't even want to underline this. It was like I was forced by God to underline the scripture. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in that which is another, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. He says, if then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? Well, what are the true riches? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? The true riches is him. He's saying, honestly, if you're not going to be faithful with the little, I can't pour on you the greater amount. And the greater amount is not more financial blessing. It's a greater revelation of who Jesus is. It's walking in his heart. It's living through his being. It's it's having his heart of compassion opened again for the needs of humanity. That's the true riches. And Jesus comes back and he says, listen, if you want to know that type of revelation, you want to walk in that type of life, you have to be willing to open up the door of the inn when the need comes and to give who those who need. Luke 12, 34, you don't have to turn there. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Listen to me, I know this is going to sound really tough, but God said it to me, so I'm going to say it to you. If you really want to serve him, one of the places he's going to call you to serve will be in your finances. I'm just being straight. Look through the book of Acts. How many times do you see offerings for the poor? How many, you just read the scriptures. They gave for the needs of others. They were poor themselves. Every time you see people growing in revelation of Christ, they're giving to need. I'm going to be honest. It is time again for our generation to support organizations like World Challenge. It is time for us to put the $40 every week or a month aside and say, I'm going to give. It's time for us to get to Compassion International, get a child, and say, I'll sponsor that child. I'll take care of that child. God is saying, give to the need. I'm opening your eyes. We know what's out there. We've heard from the missionaries. Two billion people living on a dollar a day. 22,000 children dying every day of food and water because they don't have it. And you're saying, well, what can I do? What's $40 a month? What's $20 a month? What does that do? And God says the same thing like the widow with the two mites. It wasn't a lot, but it opened up her heart to the kingdom. It opened her heart to the kingdom of God. It's the same thing when the blue bucket comes around every week. Oh, don't say that. Don't talk tithing. That's, that's, oh, you're getting into legalism. That's the law. I don't know of anything of 10% in the New Testament. No, 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 no. It ain't 10% in the New Testament. It's everything in the New Testament. God holds it all. God holds the shoes on your feet. God holds the car that you drive. God holds the Starbucks you're walking around with. It's all his. And my issue, my problem with it is, let's be honest for a second. What is in your heart that you're fighting over 10%? What, what is going on with you? What's going on with me? That of all the blessings that God gives, we can't give 10% back to him? The air that we breathe, which is his. The lungs that operate, which are his. The feet that take us to our job, which are his. And the funny part is, we're actually doing good on tithing. I'm not here trying to get anything from you. I'm just telling you honestly, you want to grow in revelation? You want to grow? You want to see life come back to the church? Then when that need comes to the door, we got to be willing to open and say, I'll give. 
I'll give. I'll give because I want to walk in the heart of God. Second, the first place we find difficult to embrace as we grow in our revelation of Christ is giving to the needs he put before us financially. But secondly, sometimes even the harder place that we find for our flesh to follow Christ into deeper revelations is through sacrificial prayer. Sacrificial prayer. Turn to Mark chapter 9. You'll be excited. This is my last point, so we're closing. Mark chapter 9. Verse 14, I want you to see this. Since I don't have a lot of time, we're going to jump a little bit. I'm not going to read all of it through 14 through 32, but you can read it later. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, teacher. I brought my son to you, for he has the spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Now jump down to verse 28. Jesus cast out the demon, heals the boy, and then watch what he says. And when he entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. I want you to hear this. There are needs that God will bring to this house that cannot be touched any other way but through prayer. Community outreaches won't touch it. No, no, no. no. Our preaching ain't going to touch it. Our incredible worship services where you can feel the presence of God won't touch it. The Bible says there are some needs that God will bring to us that we need to pray about. And I want you to hear this because this is what God put on my heart, and I'll give the scripture to back it up. Not just individual closet prayer. No, 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 no. These needs and these strongholds will only come down through corporate prayer. It's when the body comes together unified and begins to pray. It begins to seek the face of God together, whether that's at a community group or a Wednesday night service here at our prayer meeting. It's when we come together and we start lifting our voices and combining our faith that God says, now I can meet that need of that family. Now I can touch that runaway little boy that needs to come home to his father. Now I can start moving in those community outreaches where we're trying to break through and we're making headway, but we're seeing the enemy take ground. God says, now I can begin to move. When you get together and you pray corporately, There's a unity, there's a life, there's an authority that comes into the midst, and God's kingdom goes forward. Matthew 18, 19, again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Corporate prayer. You look at the book of Acts, you'll find two main things happening in prayer. You'll find individual prayer. Paul's praying in prisons. Silas is praying. Timothy is praying. You'll find prayer all over. Peter is praying. Cornelius is praying. He's, your alms and your prayers have come before God. You'll find individual prayer all through the chapters. But you know what you'll see time and time again is the corporate prayer meeting. You'll see the church of Antioch praying together. You'll see the church of Jerusalem praying together. You'll see Peter and John going to the temple at the hour of prayer. They prayed together. And they saw God move. Where was it when the Holy Spirit came down? What were they doing? They were praying in an upper room. Look at the scriptures. It's not far. It's not hard to see. It was a corporate prayer meeting that started moving God's kingdom forward. And I know many of us, listen, nobody, and maybe this is the wrong judgment, and I'm just romanticizing, and I'm just whining, but nobody's more tired than most of us as the pastors on this staff. I'm here 10 o'clock at night, Thursdays, running elders meetings. I'm here 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm, I never, I'm, I'm preaching on Saturday and preparing and Friday evening. We know what it is to be busy. I know what it is to be tired. And everything in my heart does not want to come to a Wednesday night prayer meeting. 
There ain't no part of my flesh that wants to sit in there. I don't want to hear so-and-so praying in tongues. I don't want to hear the other person prophesying. I don't want to hear that one shaking in the back. I don't want to see it. I don't even want to know. But I'm telling you, I go every single week because Scripture says if I don't open that door, I miss out on the revelation of Christ. I'm the one praying in tongues anyway, so most people hate me. <laughs> Last scripture, I end with this. Revelations chapter 3, verse 20. Circle it, mark it down. Behold, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him. And he with me. As I read that scripture, I think 2,000 years ago to that end, I think of the need of Joseph and Mary knocking at the door with Christ in their midst. And Jesus saying, will you open? I brought you need. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. I'm going to stretch you financially. You're not going to get the Starbucks in the morning. You're going to put that aside to give. I brought to you people that you need to pray over. I'm knocking, I'm knocking, I'm knocking, I'm knocking. Will you open? I'm putting together a Muslim world prayer night with the persecuted church. We all know what's going on. We see it in the news. God says, I put it right before your face. Will you come and will you pray? Will you come and seek my face? I'm knocking at the door. And for anybody that will open... For anybody who will meet the need, he'll say, you know what? I don't even have it. I'm tired. I've come on my own journey. My feet are swollen. I'm exhausted. I didn't even have a donkey. I had to walk all the way here. I'm, I have my family, and I got my own issues. But I will open the door. I will give them my bed. I will give them my finances. I will give them my prayer. I will give them my life. And as I give, as I give, God says, I will come in. I will come in, and the heavens will open. The angels will come. The glory of God will be present. Life will come into you. Life will come into the body. Life will come back to the church. As we reach out to the needs of others, life of God comes into our midst. I stand at the door and knock. I have an altar call, and it isn't an easy one, because my altar call this last week has been repentance, saying, I'm sorry. You've been knocking, and I haven't opened. We tithe here, Beth and I. We give. We have three kids. We support a compassion. We give, but God, one more time, is saying, I've given you even more Give. Give. I don't have it, God. Stretch yourself. Trust me. I'm tired. I've been complaining about Wednesday night. I don't want to be there some nights. And God says, knocking on the door, but I'm there. I'm bringing needs of families. I'm bringing needs. Do you lay hands on families in the church? And my heart this last week has just been saying, God, I'm not under condemnation. This isn't a condemning message. It's time we put it away, all this talk. I'm always feeling condemned. Grow up. Just grow up. You know who you are in Christ. Grow up. Just grow up. It's time. It's time for real meat. It's time to take real food. It's time to say, you know what? I need to start meeting the needs of other people. I can't sit here with all my old problems every single week. I got to start to give. Stay with me. Ministry team or prayer team, if you're here, you can come forward. And community groups, you can. But this might be a little bit more of a somber altar call because this This is something of dealing with real business with God. And this is my cry. I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to give you the invitation that God gave to me of just taking the opportunity and saying, God, I'm sorry, I missed it. You knocked at the door, and I shut it. You knocked at the door, and there was need, and I was too tired to get up and to give, and I missed it. And if that's you this morning, no condemnation. This isn't a condemning word. This isn't something I'm putting on you to tell you, you terrible Christian. I'm, I'm, I, I had the issue first. I dealt with him all week long. You deal with him. <laughs> but it's a place of opening our hearts again to God and saying, God, where you lead, I'll follow. Where you lead, forgive me. I'm opening my heart one more time 
here am I. Don't go on. Don't go on. Don't leave. Just keep knocking. I'm ready to open. And if that's your heart this morning, if that's where you're at, I'm going to ask you to come forward. I want to pray with you. I want to pray together. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be afraid of it. I'm the first one at the altar. I'm the first one here. But if you're honest this morning, and it might just be a few, you might be the only bold few that are willing to get your heart open to God. That's fine. Come forward. And I want to pray with you. We don't even have a worship team. We're going to do this without worship. Come here. Come here. God is not condemning you. He is not mad at you. He's just saying, open your heart to me again. Open your heart to me again. Come here. I want to pray with you. Come up to these altars. I want to lift you up. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, get rid of the callousness in our heart. Holy Spirit, don't let us see the needs like world challenge, poverty around the world, and not give anymore. Holy Spirit, speak to me again. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to soften our hearts one more time to go back to that commission and meet the needs of this world. Come forward, come forward. We're going to pray. We have prayer teams. If you want to pray with someone, that's fine. If you want some time with God, that's okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and you feel in your own heart just to pray with God what you need to pray. The business you got to do with God, you do it right here. Don't, don't look at me. I'm, I'm not just God is here. God is here, and he wants to meet with you. And, Father, we pray this morning. God, I come back. I come back, and I repent. Lord, I, I thought 10% was enough in my life, and you've been challenging me even further. No, you're going to give. You're going to give even when you don't have. You're going to trust. You're going to believe. God, you've been challenging me in my prayer and meeting with this church and praying corporately together. God, I just ask right now, Father, would you open our hearts to you one more time? As you stand at the door and you knock overseas, as you stand in the doors, the persecuted church crying out, will anybody pray for me? Will anybody lift me up before God? Will anybody ask for the laborers to come into these fields for this harvest? God, we ask and we say, Holy Spirit, soften our hearts again that we may open those doors and that we may receive Jesus into our midst. God, it is uncomfortable for our flesh. We don't like it. It's difficult at times. But you have told us you could do all things, all things through Christ who strengthens you. God, we want to give. Lord, we pray 22,000 children dying a day. 22,000 children. God, use us at this church. Use our finances. God, give us doors to partner with World Challenge. Knock at the door again, God. Knock at the door again. Knock at the door, God. We want to give. We want to serve. We want to say, God, our lives are vapor and we only get a short season. Let it be for your kingdom and let us grow in the revelation of who you are. God, I pray for every person at this altar this morning. Lord, I come against every work of the devil. I come against every satanic attack of condemnation and guilt that would cause people to leave this place whipping their backs. I pray that they would see that this is not a condemning word, but this is an invitation. This is not a word of guilt, but it's a knock at the door saying, I'm here, let me in. God, we ask one more thing this year. Would you use us as a church to meet the needs of this city? God, we don't even know what that is. We don't know, God, but would you use us in our neighborhoods to begin speaking about you again? Would you send to us runaway teenagers, God, and would you show us how to care for them? Would you show us how to take care of them? Pass just a Sunday service and say, go home. Show us, God, how to enter in and to serve. God, will you send to us the drug addicted and will you give us power? Will you give us power to set them free? Will you give us power not just to go through programs, but to lay hands and pray and see the power of God set them free? God, would you send them to our door? Would you knock one more time in this place? God, we ask for forgiveness and we say by your mercies our hearts are open. Use our lives, we ask. There's nothing else worth living for but that revelation of Christ and that life through serving the needs that you bring before us, God. God, I give every individual into your hands this morning, and I pray that they would know that as they have come forward and they've been honest in their hearts, that you say over everyone, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, I knocked and you are beginning to open.
God, we thank you this morning. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.